What does it take to become a professional football player? You probably have to stand out physically from all the other athletes vying for that same spot. And the ultimate goal, it would seem, would be to make the NFL after college, get paid, and hopefully avoid brain damage. That dream came true for Randall Brent Woodfield, chosen as the 428th pick in the 1974 NFL Draft by the Green Bay Packers. Described in his scouting report as being six feet tall, barely an ounce of fat, and very defined muscles. But to better understand the story, you probably need an example of what a physique like that would look like. <laughs> okay. But there was something else that he was very passionate about that might have even trumped his need to catch a football. Because of this, he would not make it out of Green Bay's training camp. Welcome to Monkey Tales, intriguing true stories wherever we can find them. Told by me, the left-handed monkey. If your idea of a good time is a good true crime, then subscribe or you're gonna regret it. Randall Brent Woodfield, born a day after Christmas, a true blessing from God, except that he would eventually become the shittiest gift to give to his stay-at-home mom, to his executive dad, to his two sisters who went on to become a doctor and an attorney, a very well-respected family in the community. Now, if you didn't look hard enough, then Randall played his part. He was the quintessential popular football jock in his high school. Now, if you did look hard enough, then you start to realize his one major problem, and that was he really enjoyed exposing his member to the community. And he was doing this, guys, ever since he was just 13 years old. Now, when a 13-year-old whips out his wiener, what happens? People just run away, a few might scream, a few might even giggle because it's just a stupid 13-year-old. You don't pick up the phone and press charges on a 13-year-old. Now, the grown-ups really dropped the ball here because they didn't notice that he was repeatedly doing it over and over again. He was enjoying it, he was addicted to it, and he did it even all throughout high school. And there were a few charges being pressed, but what did the grown-ups in his life do at the time? They were just sweeping it under the rug, sweeping it under the rug. Oh, Randall showed his pee, pee again. Get the broom. Swept. Now, why were they doing this? Because he was good at catching a football. And they wanted him on their team. Even at the time of graduation, what they managed to do? They expunged his entire criminal record, wiped clean. Portland State University had no idea who they were accepting into their program. Now, he would go on to excel in athletics, as he always does, but continue to suck as a human being. So we're not gonna go over the litany of petty crimes that he committed during college. You know, for the sake of time and for the sake of redundancy, we're just gonna move forward to that Green Bay training camp and why he was cut. So drum roll, blah, 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 blah. indecent exposure, dozens and dozens of them he was accused of and charged with. Now, we have to take out the serial flashing, okay? If we really wanna understand how much Randall loved sports, okay? Everything in his life led up to this moment. And when he was cut, people around him that knew him best said that he was deeply hurt by the cut. And his coach at the time in college, his name was Gary Hamlet. And he would say that he was a very hard worker and real coachable. So from that, we know that he was very serious about football and he was very serious about his body but his mind had very serious issues. By 1975, Portland police were plagued by a series of assaults on women, where a man described as athletically built and handsome, armed with a knife, would demand sexual favors and rob them of their possessions. Detectives started placing decoys at prime locations. Then one night, an undercover policewoman was just strolling through the park when a man jumped out of the bush with a knife and demanded all her money. The police immediately converged on him and identified him as Randall Woodfield. He would spend the next four years in prison for this and paroled in 1979. 
But who knew that just a year after this, all hell would break loose. It began on October 9th of 1980 when he assaulted and stabbed Sherry Lynn Ayers to death in her Portland apartment, a woman he's known since they were in the second grade. They were even pen pals while Woodfield was in prison. Semen was found at the crime scene, but DNA testing at the time was not reliable, so cops had nothing, and Woodfield remained free. A month later, he entered the Portland home of Darcy Fix, an ex-girlfriend of one of his friends back in Portland State. His motives here were the same, except that her boyfriend Doug Altig was also there. He managed to tie them both and execute them with Fix's own 32 caliber gun, which Woodfield took with him. Now armed and even more dangerous, he would don a fake beard and make his way up to Washington where he robbed a gas station at gunpoint and then an ice cream parlor and then a drive-in restaurant. When he reached Seattle, he forced a waitress to give him a hand job in the bathroom at gunpoint. Backtracking down the I-5, he would rob the same Washington gas station, but this time forcing a female employee to show him her breasts as he took money from the register. Three days later, back in Oregon, he would rob a market, and the following day, he shot a clerk at another market. Now his crimes would escalate, but this part of the story, I realized as I was reading it, I, I am very uncomfortable talking about anything that has to do with children. I'm just going to indicate that there, and I'm just not going to talk about it. I'm going to spare you guys the details, and we're just going to pick up the story right after. By the time he arrived in California, he had left a trail of tears and bloodshed, assaulting countless victims, wounding two people, and killing four, having police in every county on high alert. Sadly, it was no different in California. He assaulted at least another five women and killing two more. And then Woodfield started making his way back up the I-5, back to Portland, where he committed another murder and three more assaults before detectives were able to piece together calling cards that they could prove Woodfield purchased being used at payphones corresponding to the time and places of the murders. On March 5, 1981, Woodfield was arrested, interrogated, as well as positively identified in a photo lineup. His apartment was searched by police where they uncovered a 32 caliber shell casing matching the stolen gun used in the murders. At trial, he was charged with murder, rape, sodomy, attempted kidnapping, armed robbery, and illegal possession of a firearm. He was convicted and given 125 years. By 1990, as DNA testing had become reliable, Woodfield would be linked to as many as 44 murders. So it's actually hard to express how tragic this case really is because the red flags were there, you know, Randall throughout his adolescence, throughout his adulthood. I mean, he, he showed it. He was a repeat offender. And he was very troubled up here. And the adults that were supposed to be looking out for him, taking care of him at the time, what, they couldn't see it or they didn't want to see it because why? Because he could catch a football, you know, and if they were more proactive and if they weren't, you know, sweeping everything under the rug, every incident, you know, enabling him, empowering him, making him think that, you know, the things that he was doing wasn't that bad, you know. If they were more proactive in getting him to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Now, I did read that his parents sent him to a psychiatrist when he was young after a few incidences. And um, that obviously didn't work. He needed more. He needed more care. I mean, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that if they were more proactive in getting him help, could this all have been prevented? Now, I'm not even saying this for his sake because I couldn't even care less for this piece of shit, okay? I'm thinking about the victims, right? And their heartbroken families when he went on that rampage up and down the I-5. Could they have all been saved? So if you guys enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to catch the weekly uploads we're doing here, then please subscribe. And if you know a naked baby, visit happyedition.com. That'll directly support the channel because it's run by my wife and I, and uh, it'll solve your naked baby problem and keep us alive, I guess. Peace out. I bet you, I bet that's you, KBG. And I appreciate 
So here is your guess the punchline. What gum would you chew if your car got hit by another car?